Okay, after a couple of weeks off, we're going to uh, do the storage provider meetup. So we've got a lot of stuff to cover today. I'm going to rush through a lot of stuff. Uh, please try and pay attention because a lot of your questions that you're going to ask over the next couple of days are going to be answered. And um, we'll get to your questions uh, as we get through this. And, and hopefully we will answer most of them now so that uh, the new McDonald's support crew can um, stick to what they do best, which is cook French fries. So let's start uh, with a launch and the post NAB wrap up and what happened and what we think is going to happen and blah, 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 blah. First of all, it was a superb show. I think the show went off, you know, even better than I anticipated. I've had a little experience with trade shows. I've I've done them with other companies. I've done them with my own companies, and um, they always introduce their own set of challenges and problems. And um, I think in this case, it just kind of went off. You know, it went off well. We didn't really run into any real major challenges. Along the way, there were some things that, uh, you know, happened with our accommodations and some of that stuff. But with the show itself, it was pretty good. And and um, one of the things that I've kind of been telling people that uh, is surprising or ought to be surprising is that, you know, back in 2018, when we decided to take advantage of a situation on another blockchain, where a lot of miners were going to get stranded with expensive hardware, um, I sat down and I wrote up a software specification. I had no background in software development. I didn't really even know how you did it. Um, and little did I know that by 2018, the world had really started to move on with extreme programming and agile coding and all of this sort of stuff. And so sitting down and writing software specs really wasn't a thing anymore, or it, it wasn't really a required thing. Um, but still, I did it. And the software spec I wrote was one for something called a relayer. And the relayer was this idea that, you know, I've never been shy about saying it wasn't my idea. It came out of the original founder over on the SIA project, uh, which they abandoned ultimately. But um, this idea of a distributed renter on a big decentralized network like the one we built. And nobody had ever actually brought that to fruition. Um, and so we set about that process of doing it. We didn't have any money. We kind of worked our way up the ladder as we did it. And we went three and a half, four years. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, if you had asked me, did we actually do it? Have we succeeded in doing it? I don't know that I could have legitimately answered fully throated yes I, I i don't i don't know that i was quite there yet um but the minute i saw what we built for the trade show i knew we had done it and when everybody that came to the booth and saw the demo at the trade show and saw that we had done it i think it was pretty impressive i mean it really was you know the booth was okay i mean we did a pretty good job on you know design for what we did and for the money that we spent and so forth it was all right um, we were right next door to the, some crazy, you know, structural monstrosity that Jeff built. And, you know, it was, that was interesting. But uh, to be frank, we didn't even really pay attention to them. It was really all about showing the people that were interested in seeing what we had accomplished. And the reason why I'm really saying it like this is because I think we're in an interesting place right now um, because there are a few people that truly understand what we built and just a handful, I think, really. And I think over the next probably four to six weeks, a whole bunch of people are going to understand what we built. And as they begin to understand what we built, I think things are really going to start shifting and changing for the project altogether. Um, it's really the fruition of uh, not just our dream, right? Not just our idea about this, but literally in bringing uh, to production a real world product tied to a blockchain based sort of uh, decentralized network running on, you know, a permissionless cryptocurrency. And there may be some of that out there. If there is, I, I really can't name one off the top of my head that really fits that. I don't think anybody in our storage space fits it. Um, 
you know, I, I think there's some things that they're that are happening in storage right now, but I don't think there's anything that really has the real world exposure that we do um, and the ability to go out now and tackle real world customers. And I think as people really do start to understand that, we're probably going to be in for that next phase of the project. And I don't know what that means, by the way. I don't know if, if that means a bunch of YouTubers are going to go out and tell a bunch of crazy stories and we're going to get 92,000 people. I don't, I hope that isn't what happens, but I think a lot of people finally will recognize and perhaps start giving us the credit that maybe our developers have always deserved. Anyway, um, the show went pretty good. Uh, I think there was probably 52 to 53,000 people that showed up out of a pre-COVID 90,000 typical. Um, a lot of people sort of anticipated that there would be a bit of a collapse in terms of numbers. And, you know, they, they continue to talk about COVID as, you know, rearing its head and so forth. I don't think that's what happened. I think this is the new normal. I think that trade shows are probably going to expect to be about 50, 60 percent of their previous thing. I think what's happened is, is that managers and bosses now understand that with work from home, um, a lot of their employees don't need to go to these things and they aren't as, uh, you know, predisposed to spend money on this kind of thing like they were. Um, I think in some ways that's to their detriment because you can get a lot by going to see uh, live humans and talking to them live directly while looking at products and so forth. But I still think that over the next uh, couple of uh, years, the trade shows are probably going to be a little bit lower key which is probably good news for us because it means we probably can get in cheaper on some of the marketing and we can probably get better placement um, than we've got uh, if we showed up in 2019 and started trying to, you know, get into some of these big trade shows. Um, we will do more trade shows. I still think we're probably on track to do Amsterdam in the fall. So the folks that didn't get a chance to come across the pond uh, will have a pretty good opportunity to meet us and, and greet us uh, over there. Um, I think we're going to do some other things. I think we're probably going to put together our own uh, sort of event. I don't know what it's uh, going to be called or when it's going to first happen, but uh, I could see a situation where we invite people into our own sort of environment where we have, you know, two or three days of tutorialization and training and you know all kinds of uh, keynoting and various kinds of stuff all live streamed and and uh, as well as being live I think that probably makes as much sense if not more than actually going out and doing live trade shows we're going to be doing a lot of tutorialization and, and, and marketing on the website with case studies and video uh, work of demos of the products and so forth so that's really the next kind of the big milestone that's coming is marketing and sales behind the project. We, we really have never had anything there. And, you know, for us, marketing and sales has nothing to do with coin price. So if, if you're hoping to hear about coin uh, telegraph or anything like that, you probably are going to be disappointed because it's just never going to be something that we're going to be involved in. Um, coin price will do what it's going to do. Um, I have my own theories about what it's going to do, and I'm sure you all do too. Um, but at the end of the day, we're not going to spend most of our treasury focusing on it. We just don't care. At this point, what we care about is product sales. So that will be the thing that we will be focusing on uh, mostly. And as storage providers, that should be music to your ears. Um, okay, so that's the trade show. We did have a community uh, celebration meetup kind of a thing. It was pretty good. It was also lightly attended. Um, I think we had 150 folks go ahead and fill out for tickets on it. We probably ended up somewhere between 80 and 90 people that showed up when it was all said and done. Um, and it was really good. Um, I didn't have a chance to really talk with everybody. I, I, to be frank, I was just worn out more than anything else. Um, but I did chat with quite a few people and, and, and we did have a pretty good chance for storage providers to meet each other, which I think is a, a really important and strong foundation. And what I sort of hope happens out of that is that people start getting together and talking about building uh, regional and local uh, user groups, because I think that there's some really solid value in all of you folks sort of getting to know each other and sort of teaming up and and understanding, you know, that there's power in numbers. 
And so, you know, I, I, I think that can be the start of that. And we'll certainly do it again on the next big show we do or the next thing we do that we pull together. Um, we'll definitely help sponsor those things. We didn't do a very good job on this one in terms of the things we wanted to do at the, the celebration. We had a whole bunch of T-shirts that we wanted to give out. They're sitting in the business center at the Aria right now because the T-shirt vendor didn't come through for us. We had a whole bunch of those blue rugby helmets to give out. I have no idea what happened there, but we didn't give any out. So those those kind of went by the wayside. And we had a whole bunch of other giveaways that we did, but because the, the we were lightly attended, we had to kind of go through a bunch of numbers before we got through to the people that actually did end up winning. And then as it would you pretty much expect for our project, the first three people that ended up winning were all people affiliated with the project. So. So it started looking like a colossal rug pull and, you know, we rightly got called out by the audience at that point. And, but then some people in the, in the regular provider world started winning some things and all was right with the world again. Anyway, it was a good time and we'll do it again and we'll do it better next time. Um, there was a theme we wanted to roll and some things that theme still exists. And I think we'll, we'll roll that theme and whatever next thing that we put together for you guys. Next thing I want to get to uh, after that, and we'll talk a little bit about what I expect to come after the the, the launch uh, towards the end of this call. Uh, but I want to get into the next piece, which is the licensing puzzle. Um, the licensing has now sort of come to a, a crawl because all of the real strong community supporters recognized what the opportunity was, and they all got in in April when the price uh, was driven heavily by the rebating structure that we built. Um, the whole goal of the you know, licensing program is to sort of help fund the developers. And if you're going to be here for a year or better, um, you know, there's no reason why we can't turn around and rebate some of those funds back to you down the road when you know things are running on all cylinders and we're generating lots of revenues for everybody and so forth. So we sold about $180,000 worth of licenses in the month of April. And I think the breakdown was about 80-20 on basic to full licensing. Uh, we did sell a few standard licenses in the beginning, but we've since gone and walked all those back. And, you know, they turned into 80-20 basic versus full, just like the other ones. And um, so that's kind of where we end up. So let's talk a little bit about what basic and full means and you know what the goals are and what we think is going to happen so the questions are coming up pretty frequently on this you know what is basic what is full what are what's included what's going to happen you know are you on equal footing blah 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 well at the end of the day essentially everybody who purchases a license is going to qualify to receive storage data from the marketing efforts that we're going to be doing over the next couple of years and if you don't have a license, you won't benefit from that. If you have an Examiner hardware device, you don't need to buy a license. You already have a built-in license with the Examiner software. Um, in fact, we're also providing what now we have determined is a full basic, not it was almost said full, basic license so that you get one extra license with the unit. Um, the basic licenses will ultimately be a simple go to a website plug in your pub key, plug in your license number, and the two will be tied together and you will be good to go. You won't have to do anything else. Um, we will roll a new version of SPD and that version of SPD will have some inclusions baked into it so that you will get things like auto re-announcements and the ability to do auto pricing. Um, I don't think there's gonna be much more that gets rolled into the basic license version than that. Uh, at least for the first year. Um, but at the end of the day, it will allow you to be on equal footings as far as what data shows up and, and such. So we're very grateful to everybody who's joined and we're very grateful um, to all the storage providers for helping to fund the developers in doing what they have to do. So the good news out of that is, is that the money we generated from the licensing is all fairly, uh, high margin, you know, profitability. So, you know, it's like selling, you know, a lot more EXA miners and it ends up being a very easy way for us to buy several more months of runway 
and development from the, the, the team. It also allows us to do some things which we're doing right now in terms of onboarding additional uh, folks. Um, we talked with some folks in Vegas, uh, one who I'm interested in following up on. I'm not sure if he's in the room or not, but uh, um, we want to do some more with databasing. We've done a really good job, I think, with databasing, but it's one of those areas where <clears throat> we have some real big needs and I think we need to kind of even uh, do a bit more there. So um, that will be some addition we make to the development squad. We know we need some more core engineering help. So that will be another area. And, um, you know, we're in this process of this big transition right now in terms of, you know, I guess we'll call it from a standard uh, traditional sort of development strategy into more of an agile framework. I don't know how far we end up going with that, how, how you know, uh, adherence to sort of the dogma of Agile we go, but but we will uh, undertake to do more Agile work. We have a, a DevOps guy we onboarded who we haven't done much yet with, uh, but we'll be doing more with. So all that funding is for that. It's it's all for that. It's all for keeping the team going, keeping development going, and and moving everything up the road. What also exists out there, though, is we do need to spend on marketing and sales to get the product uh, out there in front of people. Right now, we have three products, essentially. We have the licensing, we have the Examiner hardware, and now we have a storage product. The storage product is live, even though we're not actually booking any revenues as of today. Um, it is live, and, and we could if we would if we wanted to, and I think we will very shortly, by the way. Um, but it's unclear exactly how we'll do with that into the end of the year. So we do need uh, to raise some money for marketing and sales. And I'm efforting that in a different kind of a way. It's It'll come out of a different pot. It'll come out of a different kitty. And um, hopefully I can get that done over the next, you know, six to eight weeks. But the goal is to generate a significant chunk of money that I can develop a whole division of marketing and sales folks, uh, people doing video productions for case studies, uh, the ability to go ahead and you know have the demos uh, essentially enshrined on the website. Uh, if you go to like a site like Wasabi or one of the others, and you really drill into it, you see that they have hundreds of videos for training and 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 how do you use with VM, how do you use with ArcLone, how do you use with Duplicati, how do you use with, you know, this, that, and the other thing. So we're going to need to do all that to get really solid onboarding done. We're going to have partner videos. We're going to have abilities, uh, you know, for folks that want to get in and, and do cloud service sales, but maybe don't have any of the background. So all that comes under the rubric of marketing and sales and 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 that's going to take a lot of money, and it's an area that I'm efforting in a different sort of way. So uh, I'll have more to speak on that as things go forward. Licensing, though, has been a great success. When will licensing take place? Well, the, the idea here is, is that it shouldn't take us much to go ahead and get the basic license capability taken care of almost immediately. And that should affect all the licenses, full and basic. So we should have a portal available in the not too distant future where you can go and apply your pub key to your license uh, number. And by doing that, then ultimately become official and legit. And then that way we work out the kinks of who's licensed and who's not. Um, what I think is probably going to happen is we're going to get some stragglers over the next 30, 60 days that will continue to buy licenses maybe begrudgingly, I don't know, maybe just didn't know what was going on, maybe finally just breaking down and saying, okay, I'll do it, whatever. Or maybe just people that just put it off to the very last minute, you know, that want to come in. I don't think it's going to be that much, though. I think probably everybody who's wanted to be part of the project has bought a license. So I will be surprised if the licensing sales into the end of June yield much more than, say, maybe fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 worth of sales. If they do, I'll be happily surprised, but I don't think so. I think it's. I think we're probably going to have the network that we're going to have now at this point, which means that there's going to be this weird collapse of the network coming. And you know, I don't know if those people are just going to like take the network down. I don't know if somebody else is watching greedily to see what's going to happen and is going to step in, you know, to start renting 
you know, community network. I don't know. We'll have to see what happens. Um, there, there could be a lot of outcomes over the next couple of months. But the network is going to compress one way or the other because the people who realize that they need a license and don't think they should have to support developers um, are going to probably pack up stakes and leave. When that happens, um, I'm not really sure what's going to happen with sort of anything else. I don't think it really should impact anything else. You know, our, our coin price has already done a pretty good job of compressing. So um, if somebody thinks that, you know, there's probably another leg down there, I guess that could be a thing that happens. But I don't I don't really see it. But maybe we'll see what happens. Um, but after that, I think what's going to end up happening is so we still have you know, a couple hundred examiners that are just, you know, been delivered over the last, you know, three to four weeks. So those are still coming online. We're going to uh, see those start to show up to get to what ends up being about 1,200 total were uh, sold. I think right now, if you look online, there's about 850 or 830 or some, something like that. So we still have a number of those to come aboard and those take up uh, quite a bit of terabytes. Um, so I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. But overall licensing, I think, has been a pretty good success. And ultimately, the next step will be to get the pub keys tied to the license key. Beyond that, the next step beyond that is we need to actually deliver working licensed software. And like I said, the basic version is probably going to happen early because it's going to be pretty easy to do. It's just going to be a couple of scripts. Uh, tied directly in with SPD, but the full version is actually going to be a tricky installation. It's going to be a, a build that we really need to do a great job on. We've already started to put the build on some other computers to, to validate that we can do it. Um, we're not yet solidified yet on whether this is going to be some kind of a dockerized container or whether it's going to be a native install. Um, my gut tells me it'll be a native install, but but we'll see where it ends up. Um, but the whole idea is with the full version, uh, you will get a experience that is directly similar to what you get with the Xminer. Well, the Xminer right now is still not quite yet at version 1.0. We didn't make it there um, to the trade show with that version. And I guess you could call what we have a 1.0, but I think until we get remote access built into it, it can't really be called that. And remote access is the thing that the developers are working on right now um, with all rapidity. Remote access is tied to account-based uh, access. So what happens is we have a lot of providers with multiple units out there, both uh, examiners and DIY installations. Um, with account-based access, you know, you would log into Keycloak with you know, your account ID. And then what you saw in the trade show was the console. And in the console off to the left-hand side, you saw this ability to access all of your assets on the network. And you know, for most of you guys, those assets will all be you know, provider, storage providers, whether it's Xminers or um, Xminer licensed software or whatever. Um, some of you may get into the MSP type game and, and you know, affiliate game and want to offer storage to your customers and, 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 and earn money on a subscription basis in an ongoing way. I wholly, wholeheartedly suggest you consider that because it's going to be one of the most lucrative things you'll ever run into because cloud storage for business is subscription revenue and it's subscription revenue for real money. I mean, it's not like, you know, $9.95 a month. It's, it's, it's fairly large amounts of money for most reasonable sized corporations. And that's even after we save them, you know, whatever we're going to end up saving them against something like AWS. So it's something you definitely want to get involved with. And then if you were there, then the remote access would give you it access to your relayers that you're managing and so forth. But most of you will be doing storage providers, so it'll be the, the storage provider instances that you have that will show up in the console. So account-based access will allow you to log in and see all of them. You'll be able to see them all at a glance. You'll be able to see all your revenues piled up under one page. You'll be able to see all of those kinds of uh, accounting and, and you know um, revenue-based uh, metrics all in the same place. You'll probably be able to see things like 
you know, disk temperatures or things that are tied directly to telegraphed uh, information coming back from the unit all on one page. So if you have like nine instances, you'll be able to see nine windows of, you know, disk temperatures. So you can see at a glance very quickly if there's anything going on. One of the things that account based access does uh, for us is allow us to very easily and cleanly build an alerter that you can go in and set. We'll build some parameters around that. It'll be pretty basic in the first version, but ultimately we'll get more and more robust as time goes by. Alerters right now tend to be uptime robot and a few other things that are out there, but our stuff will be a little bit more targeted at our things. So, you know, like for disk temps, for instance, you'll be able to have it said, you know, warn me if any disk goes over this or warn me if I run into, you know, network sitting at zero for any specific length of time or something along those lines. Um, but I think alerting is going to be one of the big features there. And then, of course, the big enchilada of, of account based is getting remote access to your units. So people are asking right now about how many units can you have on the same IP subnet? And the answer is you can have as many as you want and it's going to be it's going to be fine. I mean, down the road a year, two years from now, people are going to have big data centers filled with these things and, and ultimately it's going to work. But it's not going to work perfectly in the beginning to have a whole bunch of them on one uh, subnet because we're going to set the relayers so that they only access two providers per relayer. So right now there's really only, you know, a couple of relayers in operation and they're all sort of affiliated with the project. Um, and right now those relayers aren't doing a perfect job of limiting farms. But ultimately when we do uh, have this case with the software getting out there, uh, being active, then it will be two instances per relayer. So if there's a relayer out there in Europe and you have a European based you know, farm, five or six storage provider instances, you can count on that relayer only banging on two of them and you know giving you contract uh, data from two and then what you'll have to wait for is for another relayer to show up in your neighborhood that will use the other three you know somehow shape way shape or form so that's a real big thing more uh what we're really trying to drive there is more distribution so if you have the ability to separate out your providers and you have multiple providers today, you really should consider it. You know, send them to, you know, parents' house or, you know, send them to a colo or send them somewhere else other than the same location because that way you'll be able to go ahead and, and get data from all relayers onto all units. And I think that's a, a going to be a real powerful sort of understanding that people are going to recognize once we start getting more and more relayers out there in the wild. And yes, I will talk about that again, like I said at the end here on what we expect to see happen there. Um, so that's the deal. Remote access then would give you the ability to log into your account, see all of your storage provider instances, no matter where they live. Um, and then you can you know, modify any things like pricing if you need to, or you can modify, you know, ports, you can modify uh, or take coins in and out of the units. You can do all kinds of things along those lines. That won't be available on the basic, by the way. That's that's the whole idea here. The Examiner experience is this idea of being tightly integrated with the network. The DIY folk will be able to do all the stuff that they've always been able to do and have a couple of extra features along the way, and they will get data if they provide a robust uh, uptime driven you know, instance. But at the end of the day, they're not going to get the Examiner experience. And the Examiner experience, I, you know, all I can tell you right now is going to be the premier experience on the network and you're gonna wanna do it. Um, for now, it, all I can say is with certainty is that it's a convenience thing and it's gonna you know, be a much more user friendly, much more useful, much more you know, capability in terms of things like accounting and, and, and ability to actually you know, monitor and do stuff. But over time, I can clearly see, and I think you, you can clearly see it now to a degree as well, that there are gonna be some interesting situations that we encounter if we truly want to get the kind of data that exists out there on current real world cloud providers. 
look, we can go out and get archival data backups and, you know, just raw LTO tape archives shifted over to cloud and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. There's there's going to be plenty of that out there and we're going to be able to go and, and, and snag a lot of that along the way. It's not terribly sexy business and it's not terribly profitable business in the end of the day. Because, you know, AWS has tiers where they charge really low amounts of money as long as you're willing to, you know, not have instantaneous access and be very much willing to wait and not have indexing and not have all the other stuff that comes along with it. We're going to be able to provide our full speed network against that kind of data and we'll, you know, probably charge a little more than they do, but um, it'll still be low profitable you know, data. We'll have to get a lot of it to make a lot of money. Um, and we will. I think we will. And I think it'll be the backbone of the network over, you know, a long period of time. That said, there's a whole bunch of data out there that is up, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six tiers above as you go up the ladder. Um, and it ends with the stuff that, you know, you pretty much can't save anywhere except under some really crazy, you know, operational security. Um, you know, that stuff may be stuff we never get. I don't know. You know, there may be stuff at the very top. Like we may not be able to bid against AWS and Microsoft for NSA or CIA based data. <laughs> I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, we might, though. We might be able to actually at some point stand up and say, well, look, we're more secure than they are. Um, we provide a better encryption strategy than they do. And at the end of the day, if somebody were to be able to hack in at some point into the ingress into our network, they're just not going to get as much as they would get if they got into an Amazon data center. So who knows? We might get that data, but we're going to have to pass a lot of rigorous sort of understandings to get there. Now, I know uh, people that have familiarity with SOAP 2 and some of the other compliance regimes that are out there, even things like GDPR or the EU data center requirements or, you know, obviously the one that gets all the the, the um, exampling is HIPAA. You know, when you start talking about that second tier down of really secure stuff, um, it's not totally, uh, it's not the kind of a thing where you essentially have to go and, and submit to this rigorous audit process and then they, you know, tell you you passed or failed and then they grant you access to the deal it's really a political thing i mean it's it's a thing where a group has come together and it sort of anointed themselves with the blessing of the group that they're representing um sort of authority over this um you know information so what ends up happening like with any political groups you know the ways in are, are are different, but you know we know that they tend to involve paying money. We know that they tend to involve sort of like getting in with the right individuals and you know having the right kinds of conversations and discussions. And if you can do that, then ultimately you can then get in and pass some sort of quote unquote audit because there will be an audit at the end. And if we do get past those gatekeepers, so to speak, we have to be able to pass the audits. The only way we can pass the audits, as far as I can tell, is if you're on uh, something like a full XMinor version uh, installation that gives you a smorgasbord of optionality to docs, to docs completely, to provide address, name, the whole nine. In some cases, even maybe to provide some government, you know, credentials like a social or something along those lines. And, you know, some of you are just not going to be interested in it. Some of you will be willing to go all the way because you recognize that the data um, will bring a lot higher revenues and a lot higher incentives numbers than it does uh, for standard data. But no matter what, I can see very clearly that you're going to need to be on a full version once we start getting into those regimes. When will that happen? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't say that it'll happen this year. It might, it might not. I think we'll hit some of those milestones this year because some of the regimes that you have to get past are going to be pretty simple. And there's like 20 or 30 of them that you really want to have on your sort of your badge page, right? So um, we will need stinking badges. And I think we'll probably get a number of them pretty quickly. And I think most of them, though, will require. X a minor full version in order to qualify. 
So don't come back and say, but Faust, you said that, you know, basic would be on the same footing as examiners and now you're telling us they're not. Well, that's it's not really what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you is, is that for the data that we originally proposed to go tackle on the 80% solution, the archival data and the stuff that's out there, you know, most of that will still be very much provided to everybody on the network who has a license. I just foresee that when we get to that place where that really extra level of data comes down the pike, you'll need to have that um, capability with the Examiner uh, upgrades. And we will make an upgrade available to everybody. And because we've done it all along, we'll probably provide you some sort of grace on it. Um, I don't think you'll get the same you know, deal that the people that bought the full version just got in April but you'll probably get a better deal than just buying it flat because you bought in early with the basic um, and we'll do what we've always done. We'll take care of the people that have been here the longest on the network. And of course, continuous time and service is a big thing with us. So, you know, of course we're gonna take care of you. So um, an upgrade will be pending on that. I would guess that that will come sometime after we do the software release. Right now, um, the devs are not really, you know, excited about this but we because we just came out of a four-month death march um but they have to kind of go back into one on this whole full version you know installation because our goal is to get it launched by june 30th and to have the network essentially active and live from july 1st going forward uh i think we probably will make it i think probably what will happen is that the first full version that we ship will be a lot like the first full versions of the examiners themselves, which they worked, but they were kind of rugged. They had a few issues. They had some challenges. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's pretty interesting because, you know, we did meet somebody at the show, actually a stakeholder in the corporation, um, who was still running on 0.1 <laughs> version of an examiner out there. And it was operational on the network, but um, it needed a lot of help to get brought up to the current version. and. Um, I think ultimately what will happen is, is we will ship a, a point one of the software that will start off working pretty good, but but we'll still need some help. And then, you know, over the next several months, it'll come up. So probably over the course of the next, you know, four to six, uh, we'll end up being on a completely equal footing with the hardware examiners that are out there. But the network will go live with authorized data on July 1st, come hell or high water. So. We've got chassis uh, being built. We've got uh, motherboards. We've actually had a motherboard specially designed for us by a manufacturer this time around so that we don't have to go through what we're currently going through, which is having multiple models of motherboards uh, in a single batch. Um, we're working on getting processors bundled in with that. So I think what's gonna happen is when we do start to book these orders and it will happen over the next probably three to five days, um, we should be fairly early in terms of from that first booking of the order to the actual first unit being shipped to the customer. Um, I don't really have a firm number of orders that we're willing to book, but I think I will know it when I see it, you know, that we're getting, you know, pushed to sort of a limit. Seems like 3,000 is probably a number that I would stop us at. I don't know that we get there. We probably do something similar to the previous order. Um, the, so batches probably maybe just go in that place where we do a thousand or two thousand at a time, something along those lines. That's kind of what it looks like to me right now. But we'll see. Fourteen thousand could turn into fourteen thousand sales. Um, if that happened, I don't know. <laughs> it would be pretty crazy because we probably still be building them this time next year, and I don't think that really would be productive for anybody. So. Um, that isn't what happened, by the way, on the original wait list. I think we ended up doing something like 40% fulfillments. Uh, in other words, you know, if we had 100 names on a wait list, we ended up selling something like 40 units when it was all said and done. Um, whether it's that many this time or it's less or higher, I don't know. 
but we'll see. And we'll obviously be transparent about it and let you all know. Um, so you have a good idea of what's going along there. I think it'll come out just around the same time that the network starts to compress on the DIYs leaving. I think that's beautiful. I think ultimately the Exa miners are a much better installation and ultimately will provide a much more solid understanding to our customers as we go out and try and sell the storage to people. So um, it's all beautiful. I just think it's all really great right now. And I think you know, um, it, it's just really a good thing to be me right now. And our team has just delivered this thing in a way that I just wake up every morning now, just sort of looking at the thing and saying, it just became real. I don't, I don't know. It just became real. So I hope you all are at least somewhere in that same place. If you're not yet, I think you're going to get there over the next uh, six to seven months as we really do start to begin onboarding people. So I'll talk about that now. Um, what happened at the show was we probably demoed for maybe 60, 40, 70, 30 community, uh, you know, customer type people. So it was less customer potential than it was storage providers who took the demos. But that's OK. Um, I think in a lot of cases, the storage providers are going to be a lot of our biggest ambassadors in terms of going out and finding customers and doing that hunter work that we need and bringing in the, the, the customers to, to try things out. What I'm gonna share with you right now is what the process is gonna exactly look like. And there's gonna be a couple of people who are hearing this for the first time that, that maybe I should have shared with it earlier, but it is what it is. Um, we have a list and it's a pretty good list actually. It's a list I've been building since January 18th, um, famous state and in infamy. Um, and that list has a bunch of people that want to try out our thing. And, you know, they just haven't um, because I just didn't feel like it was ready yet. We have about four or five people that we have had trying it and working on it who have continued to provide good feedback and testing and, you know, so forth. But it really, like I said, wasn't until just before the show that the thing actually worked in, in my view and in, even in fact there's some things that after the show that we've still been kind of tweaking and tuning so we're now in a place where i feel like we can deliver it we can we can hand it to somebody and let them go so that list of people who signed up for the the trials which is about 30 names deep will get pared down really quickly i'll pull about five or six out of there right away um Henry will begin to onboard these people. It will become probably the lion's share of his responsibility over the next several weeks. Um, and those people will immediately begin getting couponed uh, from us, you know, giving them free access for 30 days to onboard some data and try it out. But it's going to be real data. It's going to be real stuff. And it'll just be paid for by us. And then as we see what happens over those first couple of uh, customers and, and onboardees and, and 30 days, um, we will begin to shift into a pay uh, per use. Might start off being you know 50-50 or something like that, but uh, we will move into a, a dollar uh, you know, payment pretty quickly if the product works the way we think it does. There's still a lot of things about our product, by the way, that, that need a lot of help. I mean. You can't say that we are a, a direct line replacement for AWS right now. We don't have an IAM, for instance. So you can't actually you know, bring a whole organization on board and really easily you know, provide groups and perms that you can do pretty much trivially in any other cloud service. That's a big thing that we have to work on. It's, it's part of that core engineering attack. But at the end of the day, if you're doing VM and you're doing backups and archival, if you're archiving a tape, you know, set up to the network or doing anything along those lines, you know, it's, it's working. It's robust. It's, it's pretty powerful. You can use those S3 apps like VM. You can use, you know, our clone Duplicati. You can use a lot of things on your network and ultimately it will work. So, um, yeah, I think we're going to go ahead and get probably three to five onboarded over the next week, and you will start to see the data from that effort. So if your question is, how will we know what's real data versus what is not real? It's all real data. You're getting paid for it. <laughs> it's all real data. 
The guy from Lithuania has been uploading a whole bunch of stuff. I don't know what it is. It's probably confidential material from his corporation that's really important. And they're probably getting cloud storage cheap because he's 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 doing a great job of uploading it to our network. Um, and we just happen to be paying for it. So that's kind of the situation. Um, but I do believe that over the next week or two, you're going to see a pretty significant difference. Over the next one to two months, we should onboard all of those people in that list. And we should gain more people from the trade show and from you know various bits of information that we put out there in terms of social media and you know regular keyword type marketing. Um, and we will continue to sort of escalate that onboarding process and make it easier and, and faster. And, and, and so you should see the numbers kind of begin to go up linearly and perhaps even begin to take a steeper incline as they go up. So that's the situation. Um, you know, it's set up really nicely and I think we're all set pretty nicely. I think the network's operationally uh, looking pretty strong. And I think ultimately we know now that we have a very hardcore group of supporters who are willing to go to war with us. I think we really sort of showed that uh, at the community meetup specifically that we're kind of building a little bit of an army here. And, and you know, I, I'm not really a militaristic person, so that's not really a great analogy for me. But at the same time, I think, you know, we do have a, a pretty good troop here that can go out there and really sort of conquer the world. And, and if you think about that, that's really cool because most companies, when they go to market, you know, they have to prove out a whole bunch of hypotheses along the way. And it's us against the world when they do that. And, and it's usually, you know, two or three people against the world. <laughs> that's really always kind of a daunting thing and oftentimes you know causes founders to blow up it causes projects to blow up we don't have that we've got thousands of people already all aligned you know willing to stand up for the project why because they're financially incentivized to do so why they believe in the the project they believe in the team they believe in the whole idea they believe in in all of it and so you know and when i say they i'm talking about you so I think we have so many built-in advantages that are really going to show up really quickly and really clearly. And I think a lot of people that really just aren't paying attention to us today are going to have to pay attention to us pretty quickly. Nobody at Amazon paid attention to us. Nobody at Amazon even looked in our booth. I don't even think they knew we were there, you know, when we were right next to them. Um, the other thing I would say about Amazon, which I'm really kind of was getting perturbed about, and I wanted to go kind of punch this guy in the neck. They have a guy over there that works for him that looks just like Jeff Bezos, but he isn't Jeff. And he kept walking right by our booth and it kept really bothering me. I mean, I don't, it's, maybe this was just like sort of a psychological problem that I have. But um, anyway, I thought I'd share that story with everybody. Okay, I'll uh, stop now and uh, hang on a second. And uh, turn it over for questions. Let's uh, go ahead and see who's got their hands up at this point and see. Uh, um, who wants to go ahead and be first in today's uh, winning recipe? Oh, uh, let me say, just say this uh, first before I get on to the questions. So in the community deal, we did give have these giveaways, and I did announce this, that um, I do have all those names and numbers. There are three examiners that were being given away. Uh, those are essentially being built right now in my facility. It's probably going to be a week to two weeks before those are distributed out to the end users. Um, and then there were some coin wallet uh, numbers that ended up getting uh, awarded. And what I always end up doing is I aggregate. So I'm about at a place right now where I'm going to be doing some of those di distributions. So I would expect that those probably those prizes end up going up probably by Monday. So that'll be that. So anyway, let's go ahead and take some questions. Hey, can you hear me? We can. All right. Uh, I've got, I, I was listening to everything and I, I wrote down four questions here. Um, so I'll start with the first one. Um, you mentioned the farming uh, and the IP subnets, uh, two, two providers um, per relayer. And, you know, I, I keep coming from the, um, the MSP 
the person who's sitting in the colo, uh, the person who's serious about uh, getting everything set up and running here on a, you know, on a sort of an enterprise level from that standpoint. Um, my concern is, you know, limiting the amount of data that you're going to get based on subnet instead of the IP address. Um, you know, I'd, I'd be able to get an entire block of IPs uh, from the from the data center that uh, I'm sitting in. Um, but if I load it up with a bunch of uh, DIYs and examiners in there, uh, I'm going to be considered a farm and, and limited on the amount of data that I'd be able to get from uh, from said relator. Is there? Okay. Yeah, let me let, let me speak to that because actually, I I think there's 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 some ways to skin that cat. And look, there's going to be flexibility here. There, I mean, there, there's never a hard and fast rule on our network. I mean, there there just almost never is. So in this case, let's let's think about that for a second. So you're out there talking to the local Chevy dealer about doing their archives, and you know you get this business and you want to upload it. Well. To be honest with you, if you turn around and you upload all of their storage onto 32 instances that all live in the same colo somewhere down around where, where you live, you're really doing a disservice to your customer because you're not giving them the benefit of you know, what we bring to the table. Now, I'm not saying that that's not a thing. I'm not saying that, that you might not be able to make that succeed. And, and if you can, then perhaps you ought to have the ability to do that, but just recognize that what you built is no different than Backblaze or, you know, any of the other centralized data center services. And so ultimately they need to understand that. But now here's the thing, how that works is the relayer makes those decisions, right? And the relayer will default to saying, look, I don't like forms. You know, I'm only going to take two from, you know, any specific, you know, centralized location. Well, if an MSP goes out there and sells a whole bunch of storage on that relayer and, and manages that relayer, by the way, sets it up for the customer and runs it or builds it inside the customer's facility and helps guide them and, and logs into it remotely and helps you know keep it in line or just gives them parameters of how to set it up, um, you know, there ought to be the way a way to override the defaults and customize the relayer and say, no, I'm the MSP here. I want to change it so that, you know, I can get 15 or 20 of my storage provider units. And I don't care if there all are in my basement. The customer is fine with it. I am fine with it. I ought to be able to make that money. And I think that's right. So, yeah, I, I, I think your problem isn't a problem. I think it's a I think it's a solution that we will just need to add to the mix. OK, I mean, what I'm trying to tease out here is. It's not a bunch of units sitting in a basement somewhere. It's, uh, you know, I think it's the next level there with being in a data center. Uh, it's a higher level of um, quality and performance that's being given back to the network. Uh, I just think there should be some way to just, to, uh, you know, uh, label the, the different instances from that uh, standpoint. No, I, I don't know if I agree with that, but I, I do agree that you, as a as a salesperson, right? I do agree that you ought to have some ability to to override some of those things. I don't necessarily agree that on a regular basis that units that are all in some you know more robust facility, a hardened facility, should somehow be treated any differently than ones that are in mom's basement, simply because that goes against the architectural design of the network. And look, earthquakes happen, you know, mudslides happen, fires happen, things happen. And so, you know, it's hard to, to go out there and make your primary sales pitch, this radical distribution to the edge, and then turn around and say, oh yeah, but we still believe that some facilities are more better than others. So we're willing to accept centralization there. I, I just think it's a, it's not a great sales message. I'm not saying that we won't make it possible to override, but I don't think we're going to get to the place where we change the sales messaging like you're asking. Okay. No, I follow what you're saying. Um, I'll go into the next question. The examiner has got a full license loaded into it. And when I heard your description about the differences between the basic and the full license for that 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 full experience, right? That remote login to be able to get in there and see everything that's going on. I wonder if a consideration has been put out there 
as to the additional license that the XM miners are going to get on whether it's going to be a basic or a full version and wondering if if basic versions are are given as the extra one to all the XM miner owners if there's going to be sort of a downgrade of service uh, in their experience that they uh, that they have um i I said at the beginning of the call that we pretty well settled on the, the version being a basic version that's going to be concluded along with the X miners. That there's a lot of reasons for that, but the primary reason for it is is that I don't think, to be honest with you, I guess what I'm going to say right now is I think I made a mistake in adding this extra license to the X miner um, situation altogether. And and you know me owning mistakes is never something I'm shy of. And the reason why I say that I think it's a mistake because look it, again, it goes against the messaging. People that buy exa miners tend to not want to build things, and they tend to not want to be in that mode. So here we are giving them this license to build things. Well, what are most of them going to end up doing? They're going to sell them. And if I give them a full version, what are they going to do? They're going to end up selling them cheap, and they're going to end up undercutting the actual market we have, mm-hmm. and causing you know essentially sort of something opposite of what we envision. Um, I do believe there are some people out there that do want to have X and miners and DIYs together. I, I get the enthusiast mindset, but at the end of the day, I, I, I still think it was a bit of a mistake. That said, there'll be basics. Um, whether or not we figure out a way to make those basics somehow a little different than other basics, I don't know. You know, like, like would they, would they be able to be worked? along with the console and remote access because the customer has a full version i don't know i don't know maybe it's something we can we can certainly talk about and negotiate and remote access is certainly one of those things that will be hungered for by the basic crowd so there may be reasons for us to add that down the road to the basic thing i just don't know the answer to your question at this point is what i'm really trying to say okay gotcha um, thinking about from the perspective of the person who wants to be the MSP, someone who wants to set up a relayer and get some um, some some renters on board, um, what's the sales pitch? Um, you know, how do I, you know, as an MSP, go out there and, and sell this service? Right? How do I know what it has compared to AWS? How do I know how to sort of pitch it in a way that um, you know I can bring on renters and, and customers to the network? It's a great question. And here, here's sort of the philosophy or the thought process behind that right now. So we have this affiliate program we put together and, and we'll, we'll start to drive that up onto the website here very shortly. Um, there's a couple of different kinds of, of sort of partners that I sort of envision. Um, first, I want to say that our, our vision of this thing and our idea of this thing, and I've, I've had this conversation in multiple formats with different kinds of people, if this thing was all about us going out and getting one to two percent of Amazon's customer base, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't even be involved in this. It wouldn't be interesting to me in the least. The only reason why this thing is interesting is not because of the growth and ability of AWS, but the way that hockey stick chart looks five, 10, 15 years from now. Okay, so in in that world where we're out there saying that there's going to be a whole bunch of new data and a whole bunch of new customers and a whole bunch of new people coming on board, there's going to have to be, you know, a lot of new ways for those folks to find their way to the cloud. Now, what's happening right now at Microsoft and AWS and Google is that there's a lot of training going on and there's a lot of certification happening and people are becoming cloud experts and they're adding, you know, cloud capabilities to their toolbox. And, you know, if, if you're somebody who already manages some pretty sophisticated applications for your customers or even just, you know, things like 365, um, yeah, you know, adding a cloud cert to your deal and being able to sort of specify some cloud services is definitely a useful thing. And on our side, those pros, those guys who are already really good at networking and and cloud and and all of the the various capabilities, um, you know, our thing is not gonna be quite as sexy. It'll be great because they'll be able to make an easy override uh, commission on our thing for archival and for some of the very basic needs that they have. And I think we'll get our fair share of that kind of partner. But I think there's also another partner that we're going to get, which is kind of the one, you know, that you sort of hint at, which is 
somebody who really doesn't have a lot of that expertise, who, who isn't really a cloud professional today, who really doesn't know, you know, Newtonix or NetApp or any of these other kinds of, you know, tool sets that are out there that, you know, require long, you know, training curves and, and so forth. But you do know a lot of businesses based on maybe other relationships you have and maybe another business you're in or something. And everybody needs to back up computers. Everybody needs to back up networks. Everybody needs to do archival work. So it's quite possible that you're going to be able to run into people that you know and trust who have amounts of data to upload to the network in very easy ways, you know, using something very simple like VM, uh, just in its basic functionality, not using all of the crazy features that it has, or even just something as simple as Duplicati or, or, or something along those lines. And you won't need to have that kind of, you know, three-year cloud education and, you know, big cert to, to, to convince them to onboard to the network. You're out there actually bringing new cloud business to the world. Um, that's business that ultimately maybe would end up at AWS at some point down the road. But for now, um, if we can capture them, then we should. And I think that there's a lot of that capability and capacity in our storage network. I think a ton of people in our storage network will have the ability to do that. Okay, great. I, I think, you know, from my standpoint, I mean, you're hitting on it. I'm, I'm that second tier person. Um, you know, not a professional in the cloud business, um, but, um, you know, definitely have a lot of business contacts and uh, would love to uh, start getting them uploaded to the network there. So understanding, you know, what this cloud service is and, and how it compares to others, um, you know, it, whether it's a, a one pager or some sort of training thing. videos, training yeah. videos will be the thing. Case studies and training videos. Those are going to be our big our big deal. We'll have white papers and stuff, but, but video is really where we're headed. Yeah, that's great. Um, cool. And then one final plug, um, you know, I, I did put in uh, to, to become a relayer and a renter on the network there. And from what I'm hearing, it sounds like, uh, you know, the Windows uh, version is is the up and, and running version. Um, so excited to uh, to get onboarded and, uh, and start working with, uh, with all the uh, relayer yeah, and I don't know where you are in the line, but uh, but but I think the onboarding will start, um, you know, kind of as we do with everything slowly. But I think it will ramp up really quickly because I think I think there's no reason for it not to ramp up quickly. Actually, at this point, I think I think the kinds of bugs that are going to show up on our thing right now are not going to be showstoppers that keep us from actually onboarding people. I think we can probably start onboarding a lot of people pretty quickly. So that's probably what we're going to do. Thanks for your time. Sure. Lucio, come to the stage. There we go. Just unmuting. Sorry. How are you? Um, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this this question or you uh, or not. Um, but do you do you have any sort of idea what the the ACV or TCV will be for these customers? Like a, a typical you know uh, size for these contracts that these customers will start having with you. To be honest with you, I have no idea. <laughs> I really don't. You know, we have one guy right who's been doing testing with us for a year and a half. And I think he sort of probably represents a company size that we really aspire to tackle. And, you know, when we look at his workflows for his archival, you know, I think it's something like 20, 22 themes and servers. Um, you know, I don't know how many terabytes it ultimately ends up being. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I think, I think what's going to happen is it's going to work a lot like this. You know, we're smart enough to understand where our limits are, and they are really right now probably going to keep us tied to archival storage at first. So, you know, we're going to go out there and we're going to probably have to hit volume, right? We're going to have to hit a lot of people that are going to have small amounts of data to upload. And we may hit one or two that has a fairly large installation that we can, we can go forward with. Um, I think Probably in the first year, it's it's going to be a 
it's going to be volume over quality. And then as we get into the year two, probably quality will begin to prevail. And that will happen as we get through. See, one of the things that was really clear at NAB, by the way, has to do directly with this is that, you know, we were right across from a, a product. I'd never heard of it, but it's it, it's called a media asset management uh, product. And the name of the company escapes me. And there's probably 20 or 30 of those. Uh, out there in the world. And same as VM being like the 80% solution in archival, um, there probably is a media asset manager out there that's the 80% solution for media and entertainment. And, you know, if we partner with those guys, right, or if we partner with VM and get into their drop down menu, that partnership could change everything. Right. That partnership could turn around and, and cause us to get a ton of storage quickly, simply because what we're doing there is we're partnering upstream and we might find more and more of those applications that make a ton of sense to partner. So I know I didn't directly answer the question, but I think it kind of gets to the gut of it. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. Uh, I don't think I necessarily even expected you to be able to answer that. So um and then my, my other question, which you may not be able to answer either, is uh, how many partners have you sold up, uh, signed up, excuse me? I mean, wouldn't tell you if I knew. Uh, <laughs> all right. For proprietary business you information. I mean, if you can get yeah. Amazon to tell you how many customers they have, I'll, I'll happily share mine with you. But uh, my gut tells me that Jeff doesn't want to share that with you, although he's not, not the chairman anymore. But anyway. <laughs> All right, Team Jeff. All right, thanks. <laughs> Cody. I'm going to keep your time short here. I don't want to take up too much of your time. There's a bunch of other people probably in line. Uh, the big thing I'm worried, worried about is uh, the contracts you guys are going to push forward. Uh, are those going to be lifetime or are those going to be annually? Um, depends not on who you're talking uh, Licensing, not contracts. Yeah, yeah, okay. Like that's that helps a lot because <laughs> con contracts are contracts mean a lot of different things. But if we're talking about storage contracts, then that's a completely different kettle of fish. Licenses. Look, originally we thought about it. And we said, you know, maybe they're a, you know an annual renewal or something like that. But that doesn't really make sense. You know, right right now what we need is runway. We need to get this thing you know going and launched and 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 working. Um, you know, there are a lot of ways that we're going to be able to fund, including self-funding as things proceed forward. So I think a basic license will be perpetuity and you'll buy once and it'll just always be there. I think the full license, on the other hand, though, will ultimately turn into some sort of a subscription, um, which is different sort of than what we originally envisioned, because, you know, originally, if we talked about, you know, re-upping every year, then it could have been the full price every year that you would have to pay. I don't think it'll be like that. I think it'll be something, you know, like a lot of these softwares. You know, it's it's like a hundred bucks for your office subscription every year. It's like fifty bucks for uh, Adobe Creative Cloud. You know, having some kind of a twenty, thirty dollar annual subscription renewal for the full version licensing, you know, probably isn't out of line. I don't know if that's what ends up happening. We got a year, more than a year, actually, to actually think about it. So um, at this point, any answer I give is probably subject to change anyway. But there, 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 there won't be a complete renewal every year at this point. We've already made that decision. Right. I'll personally use the basic uh, for my setup. Um, I'm using Docker, anyways. And then the other question I had is with Grafana. I, I found it in the early stages it was unreliable is that something you guys are still going to move away from or are you guys going to stick with it or in in addition to that is that going to be part of the statistics that's going to be the difference between the basic version and the full version well i think i think our roadmap for grafana has been kind of fluid you know, we know we need to get a lot of the Grafana type stuff into more of a JavaScripted environment where we have more control over the way it looks and feels. There's some very valuable metrics that we want to provide on a very consistent and scalable basis. 
that will ultimately get pushed into a JavaScripted presentation. That said, I, I'm, I've been really frustrated that we haven't been able to make Grafana work at scale. And I've expressed this to my team. And you know, they're scratching their heads and working on it. And I'm looking for folks to come in and onboard to help us out. Because I don't think we're necessarily doing it right. And, you know, I'm always going to be that guy with our team. So, you know, it's always going to be sort of some push and pull there. Um, I think that there are some really, really, really valuable, you know, abilities that come out by providing a lot of uh, telemetrics across the network. I think the one thing that I really visibly feel in my guts about this whole thing is that this distributed network is going to be this living, breathing entity. It's going to be an, an organism, and it's going to be really interesting to tear it apart and understand it. And I think the more metrics we can pull off it um, along the way, we're going to have the ability to get insights that allow us to, to better uh, tackle the competition and to better onboard new customers and to better do a good job there. So how much uh, of the Grafana work we expose in the form of APIs and, and access to the basic licensees, I don't quite yet know. But I do know that telemetrics are really near and dear to my heart. And I do know that um, they are going to continue to come back. We deprecated them because of December. But that's a temporary deprecation. It will it will definitely come back stronger. One of the things that Rhinus is working on right now, by the way, that's you know really going to be interesting is every relayer is going to be pulling in data. Right now, what we have is we have three uh, installations that are scanning, and those three installations are spread out across the world, and they're primarily just looking at uptime. Are you online or not? And when we get to relayer scanning, what will happen is each individual relayer will scan a segment of the network, not the whole network. And then they'll aggregate their findings together. Um, and what will happen is that we will be able to pull a whole bunch of telemetrics off of every individual provider, off of regions, off of groups of providers, and really pull that information together from those relayer scanners that we're not able to really do right now. Right now, one of the things that we can do on the examiners that we don't really do on any other installations is we've got a, a, a piece of software running on the examiner called Telegraph, which feeds us back a lot of info that we aren't exposing really to anybody, just a little bit, temperatures and network throughputs and things like that. So there is a ton of capability there. And I think there's going to be an even greater ton of value in being able to expose a lot of that telemetry not just to the full providers, but to everybody and across the network. So I look for community members to build some pretty neat things in these regards as well. Sure. I kind of like the idea of licensing. That kind of uh, makes the, the gaming uh, miners it kind of nullifies them. I've seen in the past, like people run up like 10, one, one terabyte nodes or 10, well, I think 500 gig was the minimum and then get off that way with more rewards. But yeah, it definitely is going to help. Anyways, thank you. Thanks a lot. Balati. Got on mute. Got on mute. There you go. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of a newbie to this uh, uh, SC. So I just want to ask, like, uh, what is the ROI? Is it, uh, if I com compare the device price and upcoming license fee, how is the ROI on this one? I'm pretty sure if you stand up a unit tomorrow on Friday, you should be able to book a down payment on Alexis on Thursday of next week. Oh, no, the, wait a second. That's a different script. Sorry. Um, nobody knows. Look, we don't know. <laughs> I hate to say this over and over and over again, but we don't know. Um, and it's going to be a while before we do know. And even once we do know, we're still not going to know <laughs> because it's going to change. And it's so tied up with how we onboard people and how many we onboard and how fast we onboard them and how many 
minor instances collapse when the licensing goes into effect and how many new examiners come online and how many, uh, you know, sats the coin price is worth and, you know, what Bitcoin is doing and, you know, whether Jerome is going to hike, you know, three quarters or 25. I mean, there's, there's just there's just way too many things involved here. Um, yeah, I mean, you can find a calculator, I guess, and get an idea. But um, I think the YouTubers figured out that that doesn't really work. So yeah, there's no answer to that question. There just isn't. And I think, you know, it, it may be the most, well, let's just say our project is faith-based and there's a lot of people here with a lot of faith. And, and I think that ultimately their faith is going to be rewarded, but um, yeah, sorry. No problem. Thank you. Sure. Trogue. Go ahead. All right. I think uh, I think I'm the, the the whole cause of why you're putting the extra license in the miners, but uh, I I think my question for that originally might have been a different question. I know there was a, a discussion or a comment that you made probably a month ago about putting out specs on the miners. Was that ever done? Um. No, and the reason is partly because of supply chains. One of the challenges we're running into right now, and I guess I actually should have mentioned this earlier. I didn't write it down in my outline. Oh, oh. Mute. Oh, mute. Oh. Um, what, one of the things that happened when we started supply chaining the exit miners in the first batch was we got, you know, vendors who said, well, we can do 300. We can do 250, we can do 400. And, you know, so we were ending up buying components on the com and then saying, well, okay, and then what's next? You know, whatever. And so the problem is, is that we ended up with four different motherboards that we've used on batch one. And, you know, I mean, they're all in the same family and they all use the same processor specification. They all use the same memory type and the same SSD. But at the end of the day, they're four different motherboards. So they have four different BIOS. They have four different back plane back panels they have four different you know configurations so um we can't really do that successfully going forward and that's why we're trying right now to kind of get all the supply chaining out of the way before we really launch this next batch um but as far as getting the specs up right now on the exa miner you know it the basic spec is what we've said it it has been and it hasn't changed it's an eight gig uh, memory thing. It's a low power Celeron grade uh, processor because a bigger processor isn't needed. Um, and so those are really your keys. As far as storage space on the Examiner, it's always been a 120 to 128 gig SSD. Um, it, it can be bigger, but it doesn't have to be. But those specs are have been pretty immutable and I don't really look on the Examiner for them to change going forward. Okay, then I guess I think my concern about that was, um, and, and that's I guess what I was looking forward to see is, is there so? I know the current sizes are 1664, and I don't know what the the one U is going to be, but uh, I guess my my real question was, could I integrate my current like NAS or my rack um, my disk shelf into these systems and use more storage than that is provided than the unit you know the question really is is will we have the same rebate can't alter the system for one year on batch two that we have on batch one and i think the answer is probably going to be yes i don't haven't really thought about it that's probably the first time this has come up in my, my mind but um and and look the whole idea of why we limited the the amount of storage you can add to the units there's two 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 things you know, a lot of people just wanted us to sell a, a chassis and let them go ahead and populate with all manner of disks. And, and that created its own set of sort of challenges in terms of, uh, you know, what we could actually rebate, how we could, you know, validate that supervisor would work correctly. I mean, when we were when we're populating with our drives, we get to specify we know what's in there. Um, we can develop the supervisor storage uh you know, manager and super admin 
to work perfectly. When you go ahead and plug something into the USB and it's got an extra, you know, 48 terabytes of storage, now all of a sudden the supervisor's got to do some extra work. Well, we've already committed to doing that work. We're selling licenses. So you guys are going to do everything you can to break those licenses, by the way. You're going to bring up, you know, hard drives that still run on old EIDE cables. You're going to say, how come that doesn't work? I got like 40 gigabytes. You know, and you're going to do all kinds of crazy stuff like that. You're going to have mixes of M- NVMe and 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 high end enterprise and regular consumer grade. You're going to you're going to throw a lot of things at it, and we'll do our best to make sure that it all works. Um, but for the Examiner, I think we want to maintain a very consistent platform, and I think the answer to that is by not allowing people to add storage to it. Okay. I think that's all I had then. Okay. Dave. Is Dave there? Probably the only one that remembers the Cheech and Chong bit. Is Dave home? Dave, come to the stage. Okay. Let me see if somebody posted they if they know the no they didn't. All right, well if that's it then and we don't have any more questions. Um, looks like we have one more. Hi. Hi, folks. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. Uh, Foss, now, previous year, I'm Amy. Um, a few weeks ago, I think you said that the uh, the the incentive for the licenses was going to uh, end at the end of April, um, on the last day of April, and then on the uh, and there would be no extensions. And then, um, and I think a lot of people that were maybe just short of buying the uh, full license um, didn't quite have the SCP, if that's how they were funding it. Um, might have had it from the, the May payout, um, but the deadline was what it was, so might have gone for the basic. Um, then on the 1st of May, um, it was announced that there was a, a two-day uh, extension, which was brilliant news for people that maybe just, uh, for whatever reason, uh, couldn't get their, their order in uh, on time. Uh, however, for the for the people that... And, Maybe it's just myself, or maybe there's you know hundreds of us. Uh, for the people who just fell short of getting that full license order placed, but then you know got the May SCP um, income and now have enough. Would you consider uh, a kind of trade in of the basic license that we've just purchased for the full license with? You know, with the the incentive for the full license, fifty percent, sixty percent, whatever the the percentages for the full license being honoured. I just posted an I posted an image in the events discussion channel that sort of addresses this. I think um, for for all the Jeff Spicoli's out there, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think we'll probably end up finding some answer here and I understand how it all sometimes works and I get that sometimes um, the messaging that we're putting out there is not always complete so it's not always possible to make a perfectly informed decision around here and so then when deadlines are imposed sometimes it can be a bit of a challenge Um, you know that said I think I think you do have to set some dates otherwise people will just extend till forever um, what probably will happen now that we've had some more conversations about potentially what the full version brings to the table that the basic version may or may not, um, we might turn around and say something like, well, if you really intended to buy the full version, you can get this part number and for the next 30 days, we'll still provide a rebate for you, uh, because it was kind of on us that that you didn't have the capability to make that decision or determination. I, I've been thinking about that the last couple of days. And so, yeah, it's a thing and likely will be a thing. So I, I don't, I can't give you the exact answer, but I think, I think there's an answer for you there. 
Yeah, no, that's excellent news and our, our example of you uh, looking after the community. So uh, much appreciated. Cool. All right. Did we make it? I think we made it. We did. We swept it. We swept it up and we made it. Great to be back, guys. I'm really, uh, I'm really excited and pleased and, and energized and all of the great uh, superlatives that I can bring to the table right now. I think a lot of you understood pretty clearly in the meetups that were happened before the uh, show in Vegas that um, I personally was pretty well beat down. I can only imagine how people, the rest of the people on our team were. Um, we had all been grinding really hard for a really long time, and, and ultimately it was affecting all of us, you know, head, heart, and, and body. And, and, and I think now we're probably going to be rejuvenated from this episode and, and have the ability to really uh, take this thing to the next level. And I think we're really um, blessed to have all of you folks along the road for the ride with us. So uh, thanks for a great meetup. Uh, you know where to find us. Uh, we'll be doing these every week. I think we're probably going to settle on this time as being the time. If everybody hates this time, please log in and say you hate this time and what time you would prefer. But this time feels like it's the time that the whole world can sort of join in and not be too inconvenienced. So um, we'll probably do this going forward every week unless we get too much protest. So thanks, everybody, for showing up. And uh, we'll see you next week.